Hey everybody, Neil Allen here, the creator of the comic series Zatswan Multiversal Guardian, which you can read for free at my website zatswan.com, the link in the video description. And today I'm going to take you through my creative process of inking and coloring this picture here, which what this is, is it's a Green Lantern John Stewart artwork that I did that's supposed to mimic a Green Lantern cover from the early 90s, like 91, 92, um, for example here's an issue here from that time period so I was going for this sort of aesthetic and to also you know do my own fan art of this particular storyline so let's get into the art and I can tell you what I think of these comics and also um, my thought process and creative process um, while I was working on this particular piece so let's see what I have to say about that I'm just going to freestyle what I'm doing and what my thought process was while um, watching this. So starting out, I'm not using expensive supplies here. Uh, I am using um, some Hobby Lobby dual tipped um, water based brush marker. So they have like a brush tip on one side which I'm using right now in the video and on the other side they have a very fine point that you could use for writing or detail work um, so I yeah I've, I, my girlfriend and I were at Hobby Lobby one day um, and she got some crocheting or yeah we picked up some crocheting stuff for her and I uh, found these um, markers there and they come in all different colors but I'm just using the black one and I, I've liked them they, I can't recall what price they were but they're not too expensive I'm not going to be using any really expensive supplies in this piece well I do use some Copic markers but that's only because I didn't have th it's only because I have a, a broad selection of Copics and some of the colors that I wanted um, were in that but otherwise I will be coloring this with Blick Studio no I'm sorry scratch that Blick Illustrator markers there is a difference but anyway um, yeah as you can see in the video now I'm using the fine point right now to get some of the details in on uh, John Stewart's face so about this piece though uh, it is um, a fan art that I'm doing that is about early early 90s Green Lantern comics um, <clears throat> so this is the we would call it these days the 1990 series of Green Lantern it's called that because the comic book Green Lantern has had multiple relaunches so to keep track of which series called Green Lantern that you are talking about the easiest way to identify that is to um, label it by the year in which the relaunch happened so this is the night based on the early days of the 1990 series of Green Lantern so um, this is the mosaic uh, saga essentially which centers around Jon Stewart the Green Lantern um, the person I'm inking in right now is his love interest, Rose Harden, who is a, uh, farmer from West Virginia. And as the story goes, um, this guardian of the universe, ancient being, uh, from billions of years ago, was on the planet of Oa, which is at the center of the universe and is the um, headquarters of the Green Lantern Corps, an intergalactic peacekeeping force, and he was the only one on Oa. Uh, he, there are other guardians of the universe, but they went away, and this, and he was always used to being around his fellow guardians, but they had gone away to another dimension. So he was left there, and he went mad due to loneliness. So what he did is he plucked up cities from. Um, other p from planets that he had visited 
and he had placed them all on Oa so that they can keep him company and he would be like the master of this patchwork world that um, of these cities that he involuntarily uh, kidnapped so what happens is the other guardians come back they deal with this mad guardian who I do have in the picture his name is Appa Ali Apsa that's the evil mad guardian who went crazy they come back and then they um, rather than sending the cities home right away they come up with the pretense that they can't um, and then so they place John Stewart here, who I'm inking in, getting in more details on his face. They place John Stewart as the protector of this patchwork. And as the story goes, he's supposed to help all the um, inhabitants of this new world get along with each other. So he has to navigate all these differences and get this uh, new society to work. Um, so there's a a lot of um you know allegories for like race relations and things like that but using instead of using like human races it's using oftentimes these alien ones and of course i do think it is of significance that john stewart is a black character um i don't think it was just by happenstance that he was put in a story like this um since it's supposed to be about navigating differences and different races and things like that so about john stewart being a black character uh he is the green lantern who was featured on the very popular very beloved justice league cartoon show from the early to the early to mid 2000s which is when I first encountered him. There is a story behind that, which I suppose I can tell. Um, so I saw him on uh, the Justice League cartoon, as I just mentioned, and I thought he was pretty cool. Uh, I thought he was, he, he left an impression on me. It was unusual to see a, uh, you know, a black character that was in that need of a role actually not to where he was sidelined or anything like that or you know secondary or in the background but he had a major role in the show and just as an aside what i'm bringing in here is called the french curve which this particular one broke it's to it's so you could um make curved lines very confidently it's sort of like a ruler you know how a ruler works for straight lines um, this is like a ruler for curved lines so that your lines won't end up bumpy and uneven but you have to find what I'm doing right now in the video is looking for the particular curve that I need um, which I found so then I could get you know a nice confident even curved line that's not bumpy not um, you know uneven and things like that so that's the purpose of these French curves here but anyway yeah um, it was pretty uh, unique at the time to find a black character that had you know a desirable role like Jon Stewart he uh, managed to have a romance in the cartoon show he managed to be the main hero in many of the episodes and he was a cool character with a cool power set Green Lantern that was really cool so what I'm going in with now is I'm putting in the background I'm drawing some of the cities that the Mad Guardian plucked up and I'm using the fine point to do that. Now I'm going over toward the logo, which this logo here was very painstaking. I would say it was one of the more painstaking parts of the piece, uh, just getting the logo to look cleanly. And this is sort of what the Green Lantern, it's like what the Green Lantern logo looked like. The actual text logo looked like in the... Um, early early 90s I thought it was really interesting and I'm a big fan of logo art and I wanted to practice my logo art which is uh, w one of the reasons why I did this piece I wanted to draw in this logo um, a lot of a lot of people these days for comics do digitally um, made logos there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but if you do go back in history and you look at like some of the logos 
the classic ones from the from the early days even from the 40s and the 30s up till um going into the 90s uh you saw a lot of these hand drawn logos like what i'm doing here and the hand drawn ones the ones done traditionally they to me they just have a quality that the digital ones do not have now um what's better of course is subjective but in my opinion i i've always been drawn to kind of these hand drawn ones like if you compare this logo to say for example a logo from the much acclaimed Jeff Johns era of Green Lantern. We're talking like the mid 2000s. Um, and if you look at what the Green Lantern logo looked like there, uh, I think the logo from the Johns era is a lot more boring than the logo from, say, the early, early 90s, which is what I'm drawing in here. And uh, I'm getting some, adding some more. Now that I've gotten my main lines in for these characters. I'm adding in some details and at this stage in the piece the art's going to start coming together um, a lot more like looking more complete is what I'm talking about like in the early part of the video I was just getting in my main lines and getting the characters in but at this point um, I don't need to use my light pad anymore so I could just ink on the characters now that the main figures are actually in and put in their details like right now I'm putting in the the musculature on John Stewart's quads so yeah I, I thought it was pretty unique to see you know a black character that was um, like that I think jo for for that particular aspect I think the John Stewart character like what you saw him on the Justice League cartoon show he was pretty revolutionary I would say um, it left an impression with me so anyway what I did is I was like you know what that's really cool I really like this character um, and so I wanted to get comics with him and that comic that I showed you at the beginning of the video when I was on screen that was I think the first comic with Jon Stewart that I bought it was Green Lantern the 1990 series number 15 and it was this mosaic storyline and I thought that was really cool so um, I went and hunted down. This is oftentimes how comic fans would get into. I was a little kid at the time. Or, or nah, yeah. Um, I went and hunted down uh, like different comics with John in them. Like I, I completed the rest of the most. Over the span of I think maybe some a lot of months I complete I went and dived in back issues and completed the other uh, the whole mosaic series which there was a four part series in the Green Lantern proper book which spun out into its own ongoing series called mosaic which is better between the two is something I kind of debate in my head I really this art piece that I'm doing here is kind of more based on the four parter that appeared in Green Lantern it was Green Lantern um, 1990 series numbers 14 through 17 I believe yeah so um, it was drawn by Mark Bright and uh, written by Gerard Jones now kind of the sad thing about this um, mosaic saga and these like 19, nine, early 1990s Green Lantern comics is that it's very difficult to talk about them without talking about their writer Gerard Jones who's now um, in prison currently I don't want to get in trouble with YouTube he was a predator essentially it came out kind of within somewhat recently I was like the late 20 teens I think like 2018 or something it came out maybe 20 no maybe like 2019 something like that it came out like he had a pretty he he was a pretty unsavory individual so um there's a lot to talk about in this video I mean it's pretty interesting um so you know like because now we can go into set the whole thing of can you separate the art from the artist and in this particular case I can because for a couple reasons 
one thing I came to really enjoy these comics before I ever even knew about that. Like nobody knew that about Gerard Jones other than, you know, people who were unfor like involved with him in that capacity. Uh, but publicly nobody knew about it. I mean, so, um, I already liked these comics beforehand. Like if I already knew that about the author, Gerard Jones, th there's a possibility that I could just avoid the comics entirely. Um, I don't know though, but in this particular case, I find that I can separate the art from the artist. Another thing to consider too is that these sorts of comics like Green Lantern comics, they are collaborative efforts. Um, it's not like Gerard Jones was the only creator involved with them. Uh, for instance, Mark Bright was the penciler. We're going to get into the coloring here now using the Blick uh, Illustrator markers. But going back to what I was saying, Mark Bright was the penciler. Um, Andy Helfer was the editor. Andy Helfer and Kevin Dooley eventually. So there were um, others involved. Uh, and it's like I don't, there's, there's something that's unfair or not quite right to me about their work also like them being disregarded along with jones i don't think that's right personally but i do understand like why say a company like dc comics would maybe not want to reissue these comics or release them in an omnibus format just because they wouldn't even though what i said i do think there's a lot of validity behind that I could also see them not even wanting to play with fire, so to speak. So unfortunately, these comics will probably just be kind of somewhat left in obscurity about that. Yeah, you don't hear a lot of people talking about them these days, like within circles online, Green Lantern fans or whatnot. Um, Green Lantern fans are kind of interesting. It's like, okay, the thing with Green Lantern and I suppose this is like a testament to the Jeff Johns era that I mentioned earlier. It's kind of like there's Green Lantern before Jeff Johns and there's Green Lantern after Jeff Johns. Um, Jeff Johns is a Green Lantern writer, by the way, or a former one. Very influential, left a big mark on Green Lantern. And for a lot of people, the Green Lantern that happened before Jeff Johns kind of is... You know, a lot of times people don't come out and say this, but I get the sense that kind of, sort of, kind of, sort of, to an extent from their point of view, it seems sort of irrelevant to them. Um, but my particular opinion on the issue is that, I mean, I'll be honest, I was never the biggest fan of Jeff Johns' work on Green Lantern for a variety of reasons. Um, so most of my interest in green lantern and love for green lantern comes from the stuff that was the comes from the pre jeff john stuff which a lot of people these days ignore just because i guess um the jeff john stuff got a lot of people interested in green lantern who weren't interested in it beforehand and i suppose they just never felt the need to go back there and um investigate that stuff the stuff that happened before I guess they never felt that uh, desire to do so. Um, so a lot of people like, yeah, they don't they don't know about it much or read about it or talk about it. And this is the pre Jeff John stuff, as I said, or it's based on the pre Jeff John stuff. So what I'm doing now with these Blick uh, Illustrator markers is just laying down flat color. Like I'm not gonna typically my coloring style involves a bunch of blending and gradation and things like that but um i decided to just lay down flat block colors and i did that for a couple reasons this is the type of coloring that you would see in the in that period in the comics in the early early 1990s and beforehand just because that's the technology they used back then um, you just saw a coloring that looked more similar to this, like just block colors, not gradients and not a lot of shading and things like that. So I wanted to kind of invoke that sort of feeling of like a um, comic printed on newsprint paper that looked like that. 
So that's one of the reasons I did it. And another reason I did it is because, you know, I'm just just recently I finished up my Zatswan, um, my fir the first volume in my Zatswan comic, my uh, that you could read online at Zatswan.com. And, you know, honestly, it took me a lot of time to do that. And um, so I thought to myself, I did some soul searching. and I was like, you know what, Neil, it's like for the sake of Zatswan and for your sake as well, you have to develop a way of getting these comics out there quicker, like a higher volume of higher volume um, at a faster pace. So I did a lot of thinking about that. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I can do that, but I'm going to have to develop a style. I'm going to have to do a style that um, really saves a lot more on time. And uh, I wanted to experiment right here with, like, say, just block colors. Like, not because typically my coloring is like a very painstaking process. Um, you know, a lot of blending, a lot of gradation, a lot of um, layering with things like um, colored pencil and glazing with watercolors and stuff like that so I was like uh, okay so we have to like get this out there fat we have to put this out there faster and I don't regret taking that time to go to do those other slower processes because I learned how to do them I learned how to paint I learned how to layer with colored pencil and that's I learned how to do artwork through that swan but it's like now that I can do that, it doesn't mean that I always have to do that. I, al I also think that it's nice to, um, you know, do something that's quicker sometimes, too. Because when I, as an artist, I think that I actually approach things uh, more like a fine artist. I accidentally laid down the wrong color right there, but no big deal. I'm covering over it with blue. I approach things more like a fine artist, you know, like a painter whose works in a gallery and, you know, they sell their paintings, ideally if they can, for thousands and thousands of dollars. And I think that was good to do that because I learned how to be a fine artist. I learned how to paint. I learned how to you know do these types of fancier pieces but now i want to approach things more like a commercial artist you know someone who does um character designs for a studio or for games or something like that or for some somebody who works for a website um you know people essentially those people have to kind of it's a different type of it's both art but different type of um different type of artist who has different types of priorities for a commercial artist speed you know time is of the essence a lot of times for fine artists i mean time is important to everybody but they can kind of more they go in with the mindset that they're going to work on a piece that can take weeks for example whereas a commercial artist they need they need to get that art out there pretty quick they don't have like time to devote to a piece that like say a fine artist might typically speaking we're speaking in generalities here so um i was like okay well now that you can operate like a fine artist because that's what you've been doing um that's really great and i don't regret that at all you know it was good for my own edification as an artist and just becoming an artist i think you know i developed a lot of skills and mentality that's like really valuable but now that I can do that, it doesn't mean I always have to do that, you know. So moving forward with um, comic projects, I'm going to be thinking more like a commercial artist where I still want to put out really good work. And I think this piece was really good for um, this piece I'm working on here was really good for my development in that putting out really, really good work. But also putting it out quicker and it doesn't have to be quite as detailed and painstakingly done as i possibly can get it and this piece isn't really like i said i'm doing this block coloring um and i still think it looks good and another thing to consider too is in some circles like circles like superhero um comic book fans <clears throat> I think that there's a, a 
a thought among many of them that the comics in say the 1980s and the 1990s um were better than the comics coming out now in the 2020s um and if you look at those comics in the night and that you could definitely make a strong argument about that of course it's all subjective but you know there are some concrete things that you can um point to specifically like just you know what influential comics are really coming out these days um versus what influential comics were coming out back then and if you really compare them it's like there's not a lot coming out now within companies like marvel and dc uh that is influential whereas back then you were getting stuff left and right you know um Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, Chris Claremont and John Burns X Men, uh, Jim Lee's X Men. I mean, you could really go on. Uh, I mean, you could go on and on and on. Um, but and what's like coming out versus today? It's you probably actually really have to think about that. Whereas I actually stopped myself rattling off names from, say, the 80s or titles from the 80s. Because really, it's like, you know, like David Michelini on uh, The Amazing Spider-Man Todd M with Todd McFarlane. Um, of course, Watchmen, um, Frank Miller on Daredevil, um, John Byrne on Superman and Action Comics. And like I said, you can read Marv Wolfman on Teen Titans. I could really rattle off influential comics from the 1980s whereas today um you really have to um think about that so i mean when you think about co which there are influential comics that come out today but i don't think they're from marvel and dc dc typically and just to interject i am going in with a posca pen uni posca acrylic paint pen to color in the logo because that's a different medium than the alcohol markers that I'm using to color in the rest of it. And I wanted it to really pop. So I wanted it to be something different. Uh, my philosophy is that a logo should probably stand out even more than everything else on the page. Um, so now I am going in to put in these stars with an acrylic paint pen. But what I was getting at anyway with my previous point is that the comics from back then actually looked more like this. They didn't have all the fancy gradation and coloring and whatnot. So it's not like you actually need that really to entice people. And now I'm going to sign it in red, which I learned this from Bob Ross. And we are coming down to the end of this. Um, and I still have like a lot of stuff I didn't say, but this is the finished piece here. I think it came out like um, really cool. I'm really, really proud of this piece. Actually, I liked it a lot. And I, of course, really appreciate everybody sticking around with me and just listening to me talk about the artwork, my process, Green Lantern and so on. I will have more videos like this coming up where you know you can kind of listen to my thoughts about issues and and about artwork and the process behind it so stay tuned for those and of course um, check out my own comic at zatswan.com link will be in the video description and i will see you guys again very soon and until then take care okay <laughs>